Like, well, hey, I want to welcome all of you to X Church, and uh, I'd like to just take a second. Everybody, we got a, a room full of people, but can we welcome everybody that is online, our Global X fam? We just want to send our love. We have hundreds of people that tune in every Sunday, thousands that watch online, and so we're just honored to have you with us. It's a great day to be alive. The Buckeyes won. Can we just, amen, can we celebrate the presence of God and the Buckeyes, and Amen. Yeah, we don't want to talk about that, but anyways, I'm glad that you're here today, and uh, I don't know about you, but I am really, really excited about this week. Let me tell you why I'm so pumped and so excited about this week, because I can't wait for Wednesday. Anybody like me can't wait for Wednesday? Oh, dear Lord, if I could just go to sleep and wake up Wednesday, I'd be so happy. No, we're, we're, we're talking about it. it's election day on Tuesday. And uh, listen, no matter how you feel about this whole thing, um, I think most of us and what you're sensing are going, we just would love for it to be over. I'm ready for the ads to go off of TV. I'm ready to see all of the signs picked up out of the yards. If you're one of those people that have a lot of signs in your yard, do us a community favor and pick it up on Wednesday, okay? If, if we could do that. I, I know that this has kind of been a crazy season. I think it's been a crazy year. It's been a challenging year. And this election has kind of matched how crazy our year has been. Uh, and I don't know about you, but I just like, I'm ready to move beyond it. Now, with that being said, I believe if you're a citizen of the United States of America, that you have a role to play in this process. That's what's so beautiful. Can we just at least recognize how beautiful it is to, to be in a de democratic republic where we have an opportunity to be a part of the process of choosing our leaders? I'm grateful for that. Let me just say that. And so I think there's a civic duty, there's a, a responsibility as a civilian of the United States to be part of the process. So we're going to do that. We're, we're going to be part of the process. I want to be part of the process. But I also kind of just felt like that this moment that we're in and we're living in right now is more than just an election. I, I feel like this is a cultural moment. This is kind of one of those, if you maybe just have sensed that there's a tension that has been building all year feels like it's about to explode, it's because this is a cultural moment, not just a political moment. And one of the things that we've been wanting to do as a community, and this is what we started last week with, is just really asking this question, and that is, how do I fit into this cultural moment? Do you realize that God placed you here in this specific time of human history for some purpose, some reason? And, and there's something that we all need to embrace about that. What is my role? How do I fit? Or I like for us as a community to say this. What does it look like for a Christ-centered community like this? How do we fit into this cultural moment? I know it's hard. I know it's challenging. But, but I feel like rather than shying away from it, we have to step into it. Do you know one thing I loved about Jesus? Jesus was never afraid to step into hard moments and handle difficult things. I love that about Jesus. If you don't know who Jesus is, stick around here long enough. That's what we talk about a lot. We talk about Jesus all the time. We're a Jesus church, and we just believe in Jesus. And he, he would lean into some of the hardest moments. He would have some of the hardest conversations you could ever imagine. He didn't shy away from it. And here was his whole goal, is that he wanted to bring a little perspective of, of God and heaven into these cultural moments. And one of the things that we learned last week, if you were here last week, is that if you are a citizen of the United States of America, that's incredible. Be thankful, be proud of that. But one of the things that we discovered last week is that if you're also a Jesus follower, that you have another citizenship. Remember, you're a dual citizen. That you have a citizenship where? In? You have a citizenship in heaven. In other words, if you surrendered your life to Jesus, there was a moment where you said, you're my Lord, you're my King. What happens is you're born again. This is a phrase we use sometimes around church. What does it mean? But, but maybe you would have recognized you got your natural citizenship by how you were born. That's how I did. Well, we discovered that when you're born again, that you, you surrender your life to Christ, that you become a citizen of heaven. And here's what I believe is that my citizenship in heaven is greater than my citizenship here on earth. Because I might have 70, 80, 90 years, maybe. I don't even know if I want to live that long. I, I might have that here on earth, but guess what? I've got eternity with Christ in, he in heaven. And so I, I need to begin to think. Here's what my challenge was for all of us. I want to challenge us to think differently than our culture right now. 
I want us to see moments like this different than the rest of our culture seeing it. When we think, I have a citizenship in heaven, what does that mean to you? Here's what it means for most of us. Well, if I get to live 40 more years, if I get to live 50 more years, then when I die, I go to a place called heaven. That's what most of us think. Whenever you hear heaven or you think about heaven, you think it's that place that I'm going to go after I die. And so what happens is, because this is the way we see heaven, is that we think that when we got our citizenship to heaven, what happened is that God gave you a passport. How many of you have a U.S. or whatever country you're from passport? Raise your hand if you have a passport, right? Here's the thing. If I were to ask you right now, where's your passport? Half of you would say, oh, I don't know. I have to go look for it. Because when it comes to our passport, here's what it is. It's, it's a document that you have when you need to go on a trip. Most of us think that when we said yes to Jesus, what happens is we got a never expiring passport that we tuck away in a drawer somewhere. And then one day when I die, I'm going to grab my passport and then I'm going to be able to go to heaven. Th this is the way we see it. But can I just challenge us a little bit? I'm just going to try to stretch your mind a little bit. To separate heaven from our experience here on earth will miss what Jesus came to do. If you think heaven is a place that one day, someday, oh, maybe we'll get there, you're going to miss why Jesus came. Because when Jesus came, guess what he did? He brought heaven to earth. Hello, can we celebrate Christmas soon? He brought heaven to earth. Jesus said, I came that you might have life and life to the fullest. Well, I guess one day when I die, I guess that's, I'm looking forward to life. No, now. He taught his disciples how to pray, right? Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in. He's, come on, he wants us to get this. I just, I don't know how you think about heaven. But I think if Jesus were here today, he would say, I came to bring heaven down to earth. Not one day, maybe, I'll just tuck away my passport and when I go, that's my ticket, my fire insurance. No, that's not the way it is. You'll miss what God has for you if you think heaven is some other place out there. In, in fact, when Jesus started his ministry, can I, can I read you something that Jesus said? Because this is the way he saw things. And as he was beginning his ministry in Matthew chapter 4, verse 17, let me read this verse. It says, that Matthew wrote, from that time on, Jesus began to preach, repent for the what? Everybody say that phrase, for the kingdom of heaven has come near. Most of us think that the kingdom of heaven is some far distant place, some other dimension, some place that is so far and far away, it's like one day when I die, that's where I'm going to go. I, I pray, I hope, I hope I go to heaven. I think all of us, if there is a heaven, we're thinking, I, I hope that's where I end up. I don't know what it's going to look like, but I hope it's where I end up. Can I just suppose, just propose a, a, a different thought today? What if heaven isn't a location that you go to, but something you receive? What if heaven isn't some place that, well, I, I hope... I hope I land there one day. I got my passport. I got my citizenship. I hope I get in there. You know what's funny is because of the way we picture heaven. Um, I, I don't know if you, um, when you were first introduced to someone who talked about heaven or whether you've never been in church. You know what I found is that most of us have this mental picture of what it's going to be like when we get to heaven. And who's going to be at the pearly gates? Does anybody know? St. Peter. There are so many jokes about meeting St. Peter at the pearly gates when you get to heaven. You do realize it's not really a great biblical construct of Peter standing out in front of the pearly gates of heaven. Like people have taken little bits and pieces of the Bible when Jesus looked at Peter and he said, on this rock I will build my church and the gates of hell won't even be able to prevail against it and I'm giving you the keys to the kingdom. Everyone's like, oh, Peter got the keys. And then we know that, that, that when we get this new city that we're going to see one day and it's going to have gates that are going to be made out of pearl. And so everybody pieced it together like Peter, somehow the janitor of heaven. And he's got this key ring and he's just up at front. And he's kind of like, oh, not you, uh-uh, not you. And he's going to open up. It's, we have this mental picture that one day I'm going to get to heaven. One time Jesus was asked about this very thought. Why? Because when Jesus showed up, he started talking about it. He said the kingdom of heaven is near. Everybody's like, what do you mean? What do you mean? 
How am I going to see heaven? How am I going to understand this kingdom is here? And one time he was asked by a, a group of religious leaders about this. Can I read this to you? Luke 17. I know I've got a few verses. Maybe just, just watch. Just look at the words on the screen if you want. But I just need us to get something today. This is going to be such a simple message. You're going to think, my gosh, this is what I paid for when I got here. But it, it's going to be so simple, yet it, it might be so needed right now. Okay? Luke 17, uh, verse 20, it says, Once on being asked by the Pharisees, when the kingdom of God would come. Jesus replied, the kingdom of God is not something that can be observed. Nor will people say, well, here it is, or there it is, because the kingdom of God is where, everybody say that with me, is in your When are we going to see this kingdom? That's what they asked. The, the Israelite nation had, had been oppressed by the Romans and they're saying to him, when are we going to see this kingdom? You keep talking about the kingdom of God or the kingdom of heaven. This was, he would use this phrase over and over. When are we going to see it? And Jesus looked at him and, and he said, you can't see it. Like, like the kingdom of heaven, if God, you're not going to be going, oh, there's the border. Oh, there's the gates. Oh, oh, there it is. Perhaps it's because the kingdom of heaven is not some place we go, but it's something that we are meant to receive. That, that maybe we need to get this at the kingdom, because they're waiting for some kingdom to come establish a new rule of politics. Maybe the kingdom is not a political system, but it's a value system. Maybe the kingdom is not a geography, but a biography of someone's life. So Jesus showed up and he started talking about kingdom, kingdom, kingdom. Kingdom of heaven is near. The kingdom of heaven is in your midst. The kingdom of God is right here. It's right here. You, you know what's interesting about a kingdom? And you see, every kingdom has, has what? Has a king. Every kingdom has a king. Every kingdom does not necessarily have a congress. Every kingdom does not necessarily have a president. Every kingdom does not necessarily have judges. Every kingdom, does, every kingdom though, does have a king. It has someone that is in rule or control over it. And, and I think sometimes living in America, I'll just say this, that, that sometimes I don't think very kingdom-minded. I think very democracy. I think very democratic republic. I think very electoral college. I think very much about representatives that represent me. We the people. We're in control. We're in charge. You represent me. I get all that. But here's the thing. I need us to see if you're a Jesus follower is that you also have a citizenship in a kingdom. And the rules are different in a kingdom. The values are different in a kingdom. They're very different. Now, you can always tell what matters most. To, to any sovereign state by, by what they stick in their, uh, in their documents and their bylaws. And you, you can look, this is so easy, you can look at America and you can know exactly what matters the most. You see, when Jesus showed up, the reason why I talked about this is because he was like, I need you to understand what matters the most in the kingdom. What matters the most to God? That's what Jesus came to tell us. And, and here's the thing, we know in our country what matters the most, don't we? Can I, can I just tell you what I believe is the highest, the number one thing in our country that we value more than anything else? The highest value of our country is freedom. That's the highest value. Would you agree with me? The highest value in America is freedom. Like, like I mean, think about this. Even when the Declaration of Independence was penned, you think it was celebrated in July 4th of 1776, and what was it? It was all about declaring our freedom from, from uh, being a British colony. It was all about our independence, our freedom. And we think about the language that was adopted into the Constitution, right? right? You think about the, the preamble even of the Declaration of Independence. You think about all people, all men. I will add women. Women did not have all the rights back then. They got that wrong. We had to amend it, Amen. Come on, ladies, amen. I just thought maybe I'll get the women going, amen. All men and women are created equal and endowed by their creator with certain unalienable rights. And among those are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. Freedom is the highest value in our country. I'll just say it. 
It is. Everything is about freedom. We, we celebrate freedom. We celebrate our, our Independence Day, July 4th. We celebrate Juneteenth when everybody was free. We say, man, we should celebrate. A lot of you don't even know what that is. That's when, that's when we had to amend things so that everybody was free. We, we celebrate freedom. It's a big deal in our country, the land of the free. Amen. This is, I am grateful for my freedom. This is the highest value in our country. It is. I wonder, though, if we were to ask Jesus, and I don't, I don't, I don't know, what he thought the highest value was in the kingdom. See, we know the highest value in our country. What I'm kind of asking today is, what do you think Jesus would say is the highest value in the kingdom? I mean, maybe it'd be freedom? Would it be power? Would it be righteousness? Holiness? I wonder if, if we ask Jesus, because see, I'm a dual citizen. See, I understand what the highest value is in our land. But what about my other citizenship? What's the highest value in the kingdom? Well, one time Jesus was actually asked that. He was asked by one of the lawyers. I mean, if anybody's going to know, it's going to be what's in the law. The lawyers. Jesus was asked, like, what is the highest value in the kingdom? And, and I know some of you, this is so simplistic. Some of you are like, oh, I already know it. I already know it. I already know it. But for those who don't, let's just, let's look at what Jesus said. In Matthew 22, verse 35, he was once asked by a lawyer, what matters the most? Okay. One of them, an expert in the law, tested him with this question. Teacher, which is the greatest commandment in the law in their day? What matters the most? Okay. And Jesus replied, verse 37, love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind. This is the first and the greatest commandment. And the second is like it, love your neighbor as yourself. Some of you didn't even know that was in the Bible. You just always heard someone talking about, oh, you should love your neighbor. It came from Jesus. Love your neighbor as yourself. And he said, all the law and the prophets hang on these two commandments. Now, listen, in his day, the, the Israelites listening to him, you see, they, they believed that the law that they had that came through Moses actually came from God's lips. See, they, they believed that it, they didn't just come up with these. And what's interesting is that Jesus doesn't even reference one of the top ten. You would think, oh wait, the top ten, the big ones that, that God gave for Moses first to give to the people. He, he didn't make that reference. He actually referenced a different part of, of, of the law. And he said, love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength, and love your neighbor as yourself. Can I just ask you a real simple question? You probably will get this. What do you think in Jesus' mind is the highest value in the kingdom? Very good. I would say the highest value in the kingdom is love. Everybody say love. Love. And, and I know, I know this is so simplistic. Like, Come on, we already know this. And, you know, Jesus was about love and love your neighbor and love your... Yeah, yeah, but wasn't that even Old Testament? I, I always love this. I, you always got to speak to those really staunch Christians who are like, wait a minute, that's in the Old Testament. We're in New Testament. That was under the law. We're under grace going to be different. And, and for you, here's what you need to know is that when Jesus was with his disciples and he was about to demonstrate the highest value in the kingdom, when he would sacrifice his life on a cross for all of humanity, see, this was the highest value. He looked at his disciples and he said these words, John 13, he said, so now I'm giving you a new commandment. You knew what the old ones, I told you what was the most important. I'll just put it all together in a new one. What are we supposed to do? Everybody say that word out loud. We are to love, love each other. Just as I have loved you, you should love each other and your love for one another will prove to the world that you are my disciples. How is the world going to know where the kingdom is if we can't see it, Jesus? How are, like, okay, when are we going to know when, where's heaven and the kingdom of God? How are we going to know if we can't see it? 
Jesus would say, you won't find a territory and, and you're not going to find a military presence. You're not going to, you know what? The world will see it when they see you love the way I have loved you. That's how the world will know the kingdom is love. All we need is love. Love is all we need. All we need is love. That's the highest value in the kingdom. And, and I know, I know some of you are, you're, you're way deeper than this. And um, I get it. Can I, can I just say what I've discovered about this is that it's really simple. I get it. But if I will be honest and say, it might be simple, but it is so hard to do. Right? I mean... It's like, come on, you're not telling me anything I don't know. God is love. We've heard that verse. I know, I know, it is so simple. I get it. But let's just own something today in this really, really tense time. It's really hard to do. And, and I can love God. I, I'll just be honest with you. That, that first part was like, love God with all your heart so much. It's like, I'll be honest with you. I think the, the longer that I have a relationship with him, the easier it is to love him. If you don't know God, I think sometimes you fear God. I understand that. But the moment you discover how much God is passionate for you and how much God loves you so desperately, the moment you come to grips with that, then you find out it's not hard for me to love God. He is so merciful and he's so gracious and he's so forgiving and he just gives and gives and gives and I don't deserve it. And when I think about that kind of love, I'm like, okay, I can love a God like this. I think I can do that pretty well. You know what I found is the harder part? It's loving your neighbor as you love yourself. Hello? That's hard. I love God. God is perfect. God is good. It's loving you that's really tough. It's, it's hard to love your neighbor sometimes. Any of you ever had a neighbor that was hard to love? We do. I think God wanted to teach me for the last decade about love. And so he gave me a neighbor that's not very lovable. We have this, this neighbor in our neighborhood. I'm not going to say which house or which address or his name. But we have a neighbor in our neighborhood that makes it so hard to love. I mean, it just complains about everything, files complaints on everybody. We have a homeowners association, so, you know, you file complaints on everybody. Uh, there, there was one time, it was really hot in the middle of the summer, and uh, we don't have a swimming pool, but we wanted to go outside in the sun. And, uh, and so I, I happened to uh, pick up one day when I was at Walmart, I picked up this inflatable blow-up uh, kiddie pool. It was like three foot wide, you know, kiddie pool. Just put a little bit of water in it. And I thought, we could use that when we're outside laying around. You get hot, you just go jump in the kiddie pool. You know what I mean? It's a little, little kiddie pool. It looked ridiculous, but we put it on our patio. And so, you know, we lay out in the hot sun and we put our feet in it. We just jump in it and it was great. All of a sudden, one day we got notification from the homeowners association. We got a, a notification that somebody filed a complaint. Because according to the bylaws... You're not allowed to have above ground pools in our neighborhood. I'm like, this is not an above ground, it's a baby pool. What are you talking, oh, 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 we all knew who it came from too. There's only one person that complains about everybody. We all knew who it was. You know, strangely enough, and we still do not know to this day, but it was like a day or two later we came back and it had a rip in it, and all the water had gone out, and I just, I don't know if somebody came over to, I don't know. I, I, I'm telling you, God has given us a neighbor to teach us about loving your neighbor. One time, I, I remember I was pulling out of my driveway, and he was, he, he was driving around um, to police the neighborhood. That's what he does. And I pulled out, and apparently I pulled out too close to the car, and he waved at me with two hands and two fingers. He, it was so nice. He waved at me. And uh, I thought I should really give him some love, so I slammed on my brakes, honked my horn, and put it in reverse to back up because I thought he wanted to have a conversation. And then the better God of me, and I just drove off after that moment. You ever had anybody, I'm just being honest, you ever had anybody who's really hard to love? Yeah? I, I think we all have had that person. You know, it, it, I feel torn inside. 
I, I feel like even right now in this season, like that all of us have people and it has been amplified. It has been magnified in a season that is so tense and we're so divided that, that, that I'm supposed to love my neighbor? Like, and I don't mind loving people that I like. You know, like, I, I don't mind loving people that I like. But I guess I'm really challenged with this thought right now. Do, will I love people that I don't like? Will I love people that I, I don't think like? Will I love people that don't vote like I vote? Will I love people that come from a different political persuasion? Will I love people that are across the aisle? Will I love it? Because right now, let's be honest, we, 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 I feel this tension inside and I feel torn. Let me tell you why I feel torn. I feel torn because I watch our, our nation and I see the battles that are going on and I feel the tension of the issues right now. And there's part of me inside that wants to kind of fight and wants to kind of stand up. I get that. I want to stand up up for what I believe in and I want to kind of that's what makes America great we should be able to do that but on the other hand also I'm, as a citizen of the kingdom I'm supposed to love the very ones that I want to fight with and so I feel the tension inside do you feel it and and, and I also see a lot of people who are part of a kingdom tearing apart others because, because I have a different opinion. Can I, can I just, I want us to sit in this for a moment. Because this has been the ugly side of what we've experienced. I, I've seen people end relationships. End, cut off relationships because we cannot agree politically. I, I, family members won't talk. Some of you, that's, that's in your story. Won't talk. Like, I just won't even talk to him because if we do, we're going to fight and I'm so mad and I don't like him right now. And I understand all of that. But what we've done is, is Jesus who would say, can I just tell you, if you're a citizen of the kingdom, what matters most to me is love. Not your political persuasion. Not how you vote. Not what you're holding on and what you think is important. What matters most to me is love. And I want you to love your neighbor. Well, which neighbor? Because I got one neighbor that I don't love. And I got other ones that I do like. You know what we've done? We've made enemies out of our neighbors. That's what we've done. You're, all, oh, you're over. It's us. It's them. We made enemies out of our neighbors. Listen, we're not the only ones. This is the, this is the struggle that we have with this. I know this is simple. You're like, okay, all I got to do is love. I know, but we're, I'm not seeing a lot of it right now. I'm just not seeing it. What does it mean to love my neighbor? And that question that, that I have and that we all have is, okay, well, well, can we define neighbor then? Right? That's what, that's what another lawyer who came to Jesus one time said. You know, there's a lawyer who came to Jesus one time, and he, he asked him the simple question. Something all of us want. He said, um, how do I get into the kingdom of heaven? How do I inherit eternal life? That's what he's asking. How do I get there? How do I get this? And Jesus said, you know the law better than I do. I mean, you're a lawyer for Pete's sake. You should know this. And you know what his answer was? He, he said, um, oh, I know, because he had heard Jesus say this before. Love God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength, and love your neighbors yourself. And Jesus looked at him and was like, you got it, winner, winner, chicken dinner, just go do that. What's the big deal? And then the guy followed it up with a clarifying question. Now listen, we in the church, we won't ever ask this question out loud, but I promise you, you process it internally every day. He said, well, well then can we define who my neighbor is? Who's my neighbor? Who do I have to love? What, what does it look like to love that person? And so Jesus said, oh, okay, I know where you're going with this. And so he tells a story. He tells this, this story. He says there was a, a Jewish guy one day. He was walking on the road from Jerusalem to Jericho. Stop me if you've heard this one. No, it's not a joke. It's his story. He, he, he's walking on the road, and he gets jumped by some thieves, some bandits, and they beat him within an inch of his life. They leave him half dead on the side of the road, steal all this stuff. 
And Jesus says, it just so happens right after, and he's laying there and he's like, I mean, bleeding out. He says a priest comes walking by on the road. A priest, a pastor, religious leader of their day. And he sees this guy struggling, bleeding out. And he sees him and he, oh, ooh, yeah, that's a, that's a mess. And he passes by on the other side of the road. No tourniquet, no, no, just passes by on the other side of the road. And then shortly after that, a Levite comes through. You say, what's a Levite? A Levite's a staff member of the church. Might not be a pastor, but it's a staff member. And, and the Levite does the same thing. He sees this guy bleeding, and he's like, well, I, I got things to do, and man, I'll pray for you. That's what, that's what we'll say, right? Lord, I pray that you would help him. Help him, Lord, any way possible. Just bring, maybe bring somebody to help him as I pass by on the other side of the road. And then Jesus said, a Samaritan walked by. A Samaritan. Now, you need to understand about the relationship between the Samaritans and the Jews. The Samaritan was despised by the Jews. They were considered um, half-breeds. They, they were, let's just put it this way, there was deep racism between the Jews and the Samaritans. They hated each other, despised them. It was a very us and them, right? Like, let me contextualize it. It would be like Michigan fan and Buckeye fan, okay? It's... It would be like us and them, all right? And a Samaritan walks by, and, and Jesus, I love this, and telling this story. Let me read this part to you. In Luke 10, verse 33, it says this. Then a despised Samaritan. I, I love the way Luke writes it. That's how the Jews saw him. Then a despised Samaritan came along, and when he saw the man, he felt compassion for him. And going over to him, the Samaritan soothed his wounds with olive oil and wine, and he bandaged them. And then he put the man on his own donkey. What do you think about this? So he walked. He put the man on his ride. And he took him to an inn where he took care of him all day long. The next day, he handed the innkeeper two silver coins, telling him, take care of this man. And if his bill runs higher than this, I'll pay you the next time I'm here. Wow. Can I tell you something? That's love. To see somebody that should be your enemy and make them your neighbor. He's moved with compassion. You, you know the, the Greek word, you don't care about the Greek word, that's fine, but... It's this word, splagnizomehi. It's a big, long word. It really talks about the bowels. I'm not trying to be gross, but... In other words, it was like from deep within. You ever felt a burden? You ever felt something like, I can't walk beyond this without stopping now? I have to do something. It, it, see, they believed back in that day that it was in the bowels that... That was the seat of love and mercy and compassion. And so Jesus said he felt something inside of him that he had to do something about it. And he took somebody that the culture in his context would say is your enemy and made him a neighbor. What would I want if I were lying there and somebody came by? And so he bandaged his wounds and he and he cared for him. This is not what you'd expect. But Jesus, again, is talking about the, what matters to God right now. And I, and I love what, what happens and what he says in verse 36. He says, now which of these three would you say was a neighbor to the man who, attacked, who was attacked by bandits, Jesus asked. And the man replied, the one who showed him mercy. And Jesus said, now go do the same. I just, I don't, I don't know. I just felt like we needed to hear something like this today. I know it's simple. Come on, man. I wanted something, I don't know, revelatory, blow my mind. I, I wanted something. I think Jesus says, I just want you to, to represent my kingdom well right now. Which political party should I? Jesus says, I'd rather you just represent my kingdom well right now. You know, I wonder if Jesus, I was, I was thinking about this. I wonder what, what would happen if Jesus 
decided to show up in America and run for office. I actually wonder whether or not he'd even get elected. He probably wouldn't get far enough in the process to even get the opportunity to get votes. But I wonder if Jesus were to run for office, I I was trying to think, what would Jesus say is his campaign slogan? Because we've heard build better back, keep America great. We've heard all these. Can I just tell you, that is not what his slogan would be. Do you know what I think his slogan would be that would represent the kingdom? I bet it would be something like this. Our love is greater than our differences. I wonder if he wants us to see that our love is greater than our difference. You see this shirt? By the way, we're selling this shirt. You wonder what the shirt was about. It says on our shirt, the shirt we're selling in our shop, our love is greater than our differences. I think the world needs to see a community of people that might come from different political persuasions, different socioeconomic backgrounds, different colors, different everything, who could come together, who would represent what it looks like to truly be united, who would say, our love is greater than our differences. I don't care what you look like. I don't care how you vote. I don't care the way you think. I don't care how much money you have. All I know is that our love is greater than our differences. The thing that unites us is more important than the things that separate us. All I know is if Jesus were here today, he would say, you know what matters most to me in this moment is that my church would show the world that I am love. I think the church should represent the kingdom more than our culture. You might not like hearing this, so I'll step on your toes. I think the church should represent the kingdom more than our country. I'm not anti-America, but I know this, my citizenship in heaven is greater than my citizenship down here on earth. And I know what matters to God matters more than what matters in my country. And God says that love is what matters. What if we could just get this? Because here's what I've seen over the the church. We we want a whole position. We, we want to, st- oh, I, listen, I'm not saying we don't need truth. God has given us truth in his word. You come here, I'll preach the truth of God's word. But can I just say this? The problem has been is the church and a lot of the Christians have said, I want the world to know I'm right. Jesus said, the world will know you're my disciple by how you love. Not how right you are. I love what the Apostle Paul wrote to the church, 1 Corinthians 13. He said, I don't care if you can speak with the tongues of angels, and I don't care if you can fathom mysteries beyond all imagination, and I don't care if you have faith that you can move a mountain, and I don't care if you think you're the most generous people in the world. If you don't have love, you have nothing at all. I know this is simple, but I just wonder what it would look like What would it look like this week? I know this is a really intense week for our our country. This is when everybody's going to ramp up and they're going to, the chatter is going to be louder than ever and the fighting is going to be worse than ever. And what about us? Let's just talk about us right here. If you're watching this, let's talk about us. What would it look like for us this week to say, you know what? I'm going to make the highest value love. I'm going to love people. I'm going to, I'm going to sow kindness this week. I'm going to sow unity this week. What would it look like if the church, the greatest force on the planet, didn't stoop down to this cultural moment to sling mud like everybody else, but we lifted above and said, we're going to bring heaven to earth. We're going to bring heaven down here. I'm going to demonstrate heaven. I'm going to live and I'm going to love like heaven this week. Amen. Come on, can we stand to our feet? Can we stand to our feet today? I want for us to just dedicate ourselves this week. We're going to pray. We're just going to dedicate ourselves to say, God, show me how to love. I know this message was so simple. But maybe what we need to do is in all the complexity of what's going on, we just need to get back to what's simple. And say, I just want to love like Jesus. 
I wanna love people that I've, I've made enemies. I'm gonna turn them into a neighbor. And if you can't do that, Jesus also said, love your enemies. So either way, we're gonna love. Come on, let's bow our heads. Let's ask God to, to give us the strength to do this. Father, we just come to you right now. God, we, we need you. I, this is so simple, but it is so hard to do, God. And I just pray right now, Lord, for our community. And I, I pray, God, if there's anybody right now that's, that's in this moment that just doesn't even know your love. You see, God, I, I really believe it's hard to love when you don't realize you've been loved. Listen, as we're just sitting in this moment here with God, it's just you and God. Maybe some of you would recognize and say it's, it's been hard for you to love others. Can I just tell you this? You, you, you will never be able to love like Jesus until you receive the love of Jesus. Until you invite him to be the Lord of your life, the king. Until you invite him to be king over your life, you'll never grasp this value and what it means. But the moment you realize how much you've been loved by God, the response of love will flow out of you. So right now in this moment, maybe there's someone here today that you're just coming face to face with the love of God. Can I just tell you something that God loves you so much that he sent his one and only son, Jesus, who died a sinner's death so that you could have life, eternity, so you could have life to the fullest now. Not one day in some place, but God, that we could experience heaven right now in this moment. If today you wanna receive Jesus as your Lord and Savior, you're saying today I want him to be the Lord of my life, would you just say a prayer with me right now? Just say, God, today I receive your love. I surrender my life to you. I forgive, forgive me of my sin, God. God, I just pray right now in this moment, you can have my life. God, you can have it all. You can have it all. Come on, church, I, I think for all of us in this moment, if you would feel comfortable enough, would you just lift your hands to heaven because maybe what we need is we need to receive the love of God today. Maybe we've been trying to represent Jesus but have not received his spirit and received his love and received his presence. And I just think in this moment right now that maybe God wants to fill you up, that God wants to set you free, that God wants to lift you to a new place, a higher place, that God wants to elevate us to a new place where we give glory to God, where we glorify his name. Come on, what would it look like for us as a church to celebrate His presence, His love? Come on, what does it look like for us to declare it in this place?